pretty stiff price. Here it is, Dan's cell line. Admit is the button I'm clicking on. Okay, we got Elizabeth, Katharia, Sally, and Dan. And a bit of a feedback. Okay. Yeah, Dan, I think between your cell and uh, Sally's microphone. Okay, everybody's got their mics muted now. So. Why is my more button flashing? I believe you all can see uh, my AutoCAD on the left side, correct? And I've got um, Google Classroom open on the right. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Great. Great. <laughs> okay. While we're waiting, uh, some of these files that I uploaded to week number one in Google Classroom, for some reason they, they won't open up on in a browser. I got to figure out how to download them. But, but um, hopefully by now y'all have this errata sheet. Um, there's been very, very little change since introductory. So I, uh, it'll very rarely get updated. Um, I'm trying to put a little asterisk every time I reference an exercise in handouts. I want to put a little asterisk next to the exercise as a reminder to go to the errata sheet to find a, a clarification or a typo correction. Another file I should send y'all. This is, uh, I sent you two weeks worth of the handouts. On the right side of my screen is our mission today to see how much we've forgotten since introductory. There's, you know, some, I often refer to this assignment as a placement exam. Like you're, as if you need to um, pass this exam to, to start the class. Anna's joining us. Haven't, there's the admit button. Anna is joining. Hey, Anna. Um, also, since, since I don't believe there'll be any changes, I included two pages of handouts for week number two. We're just going to be playing with little uh, Legos or wooden blocks next week, using the box command to make a, a solid block or box, stacking them up in different shapes and rotating them, and uh, play with a 3D free orbit. Can I highlight that? There we go. 3D free orbit is a 3D viewing tool that, that I find extremely helpful. There's several. Okay, Kurt is joining us. Kurt, I think you're tuned in on uh, on a cell on a, oh an iPhone. I have no idea if that's got Zoom capability. I, I hope so. Kurt, your your mic is turned on, so okay. Be aware. Okay. Uh, yeah, Kurt, I was telling the telling the others in the in the class. Uh, you've managed to remotely access your office AutoCAD, and uh, yes, you just have to have it approved through your manager. Yeah, you know, I. I sorry, hate to tell you this, but I wonder if uh, it varies from the, you know, not only you need permission, but your department needs the technology. Uh, now, yeah, I, I have a laptop assigned to me, so 
so that that is one thing that you do have to have but um i i called uh and i can't remember her name the lady that is in in charge of the night school and she said as long as it was approved through my manager that it was okay yeah that's sherry morgan yes she's been with us uh i guess she started in january and um, now it, it does also help that i i now actually work in the o22 department for the apprentice school <laughs> so oh cool so that kind of helps yeah I'll make note of that i try to you know keep all email addresses and all phones and departments and eventually i'll need uh you know building number and floor number and seat number to get uh you know the fancy uh fancy printed certificates to you are you an are you a apprentice instructor curtis yes yeah i started about a month ago excellent Yeah, I, uh, I used to write my bio in the syllabi as opposed to syllabuses. And, uh, I considered becoming a high school physics teacher, believe it or not. Um, I think I asked the, uh, I want to say Dr. Hughes was the head honcho of the apprentice school. I believe he's retired now. Yes. And I believe I conversed with him about working for the apprentice school and I can't remember how it went. Something I didn't didn't know a trade well enough. Uh -oh. It might be different now with with AutoCAD, but uh from and from what I understand, when I went through the apprentice school, all of our mechanical drawing was done uh, pencil and paper, and um, now only one drawing is done with pencil and paper, and everything else is also is done through AutoCAD. That's what I want to hear. I was in the shipyard from '82 to '90. I believe the uh, a 3D system called Vivid was in its infancy, and Dr. Hughes might have been the what's it called brainchild or uh, the, the Frankenstein doctor, or whatever for for Vivid. Can't remember. I think uh, maybe I'm getting getting names confused. I, I think the Vivid subject matter expert who left the shipyard more i think of it so it probably wasn't dr hughes anyway now i hear why well, i i heard today actually from someone you know that the shipyard they started with autocad and then they switched over to something and it didn't work out and then we switched back to autocad um in the early 80s i recall a system called cadam and that that might be it. Yes, I. Uh, it's the first I heard of an AutoCAD being used prior to CAD-AM. Now I want to say uh, NX is in some departments. Is that a Siemens CAD system? Maybe. It very well could be. I know we have Siemens. We have a lot of stuff in the shipyard that Siemens does for us yeah years and years ago i seem to recall there was a pipe bending department that used intergraph because it had the capability of computer numeric controlling the pipe bends something like that that was a long time ago and I'm hearing less and less about Autodesk's inventor. Not sure if it's still around in shipyard at all. Yeah. 
every couple of years. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, they're still using inventors right. being used from our department in 22. About every other year, one student says, well, how about an inventor coming to the night school? And unfortunately, there's you know, never six or eight people at the same time asking that. So I don't know if uh, Dan was speaking, right? Yes. Well, I don't know if you could you know, lobby to get enough people to request it that maybe it could be added i could ask around um i've only been with the company a couple of years though so i don't have a lot of clout <laughs> yeah i understand outside of the shipyard i hear a lot of a lot of talk of solid works being used and i wondered if if i'll have to learn solid works to keep up the beer money. <laughs> the community colleges might might go to solid works. And I think a lot of the NASA subcontractors use solid works. I haven't heard of it on the Air Force Base though. I did hear a little bit of uh, Microsoft's Visio on the Air Force Base. And I think Visio, last I heard, Visio is kind of you know, downgraded to just logic diagrams and seating charts or you know, very, very simple stuff. Well, it's uh, well after 4.15. I'm looking at uh, about nine attendees and one or two. I was about to say one or two on are on both cell phone and computer, but I guess that would be you and Sally, Dan. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I got uh, about nine attendees online. I'm sure hoping more will come in. Um, getting back to the handouts uh, again next week. We'll stack up these uh, shoe boxes. We'll, we'll extrude rectangles or use the box command. The box is pretty limited. You just type box enter and type length, width, and height, and you end up with a solid box. But pretty quick, we get into the extrude command. Where any closed polyline and I believe a region, which, which I really don't teach at all, but uh, generally speaking, a closed polyline you can extrude into into a shape. And next week we'll get into triangle, pentagon, and hexagons, just because they're simple objects made with uh, the polygon command and uh, stack them up. We'll also learn some visual styles. Years ago, AutoCAD referred to visual styles as, oh, nuts, I had it an hour ago. And lost it now, but we had a different name for it, for visual style. I'm gonna lose sleep on that now. So that'll be, uh, might be a short week next week. Maybe we can get ahead between uh, making boxes and stacking them and you know, making polygons and stacking them up, exercising a few of these uh, visual styles. Conceptual, I, uh, I like to use a lot. It's kind of like a, a simple spray painting of a color. But uh, I can see some advantages to x-ray, because not only you can see the object, but you can see through it to oh snap on endpoints and midpoints on the far side of objects. Uh, the, uh, the simple one is, uh, what's it called? 
2D or 3D wireframe is kind of an efficient, you know, simple. Uh, anyway, starting to babble here. Um, what else? Also on the classroom is uh, this is the usual list of YouTube tutorials, and you get about two thirds of the way down the list, and you get into the uh, layouts. You hear about line 47 of the YouTube tutorial list starts getting into the uh, 3D modeling topics we have in intermediate year. And uh, what else? This is, you might say, the deliverable today, exercise number 90. I don't expect you to, to do the solid model. In a few weeks, I might assign you to you do the solid model once, once we learn how to do with a revolve command to do the little countersink drilled holes. Uh, the subtract command will have to vaporize this little disk out of the ends. Next week, you can. Uh, you know, take the, you know, develop a polyline of the front perimeter here and extrude it into like a casting of this object. So you're not smart enough yet to put the counter, uh, counter bore, the through hole, and the four counter sink holes in yet. What else? Oh, and of course the syllabus of Updated that a couple of times. All right, I just heard a chime. Lex is joining us. That might be Alexia or Alexander. Lex is joining us. So again, with the exception of the 3D model on this exercise, number 90 handout in, in the classroom and I, I emailed you. I've made some revisions since the one I emailed you, but they're minor changes. With the exception of this 3D model, I'm hoping that we all can finish exactly what you see here with the exception, with uh, including, you know, put, you know, name the file your first name and, uh, and call it WK1 for week one assignment. And anything extra, you know, like date and exercise number 90 and anything like that is, is overkill. But uh, who else is coming in now? I just heard a chime, but don't see a button to hit. Okay, Lex, it sounds like your microphone is not working. Okay, your microphone is now working. I felt sure I heard a, a, a chime, but don't see anything. Anyway, um, so the, the point of today's class, hello. Um, I think some of this Zoom stuff tends to, uh, it's invisible to y'all, but covering up parts of my screen. How can I move it out of the way here? I try to drag this list of participants and anytime I touch it, it pops into the uh, maximize. I guess I'll just have to minimize it, and get it out of the way. Anyway, this um, today's assignment is once you see my AutoCAD screen again, I'd like you to put your name and you know first name and WK1 as the file name. So that'll tell me I open up your file. I know you know by the by the by your first name. I know who's who I'm working with, and I'll add a 
a red layer of comments. I haven't been collecting the, this uh, week number one assignment in the past. But you reserve the right to, to do that later. Um, I, I, I've never really had to enforce this, but I'm hoping this exercise will enlighten some of the students that didn't come directly from introductory and realize that, whoa, I forgot more than I thought I did. And unfortunately, they, they're, they're not running introductory now in the fall. So it's, uh, you know, I, I like to use this exercise as a, as a, you know, a, a hint that, hey, uh, maybe you ought to switch over to the introductory class. And you're, it's up to you to attend both. Again, only intermediate is taught this time, but I don't mind when they're taught together if you attend them both and decide which you're more comfortable in. Um, Cross-hatching, I think I demonstrated on the final day of introductory, but it's really not in the lesson plan for introductory. Um, anyway, get, let's get started on doing exercise number 90. I believe the textbook is missing this 30 unit dimension right here. And uh, because of that, it's exercise 90 is on the errata sheet. Um, I think your textbook has this dimension 7 locating both top and bottom circles. And the more I think of it, it's probably okay to dimension it in both places. But my errata sheet points out that the, uh, the six and seven dimensions here are redundant because uh, it's, it, you can assume it's a mere copy right and left, up and down. But the more I think of it, I don't think it hurts to add those redundant dimensions. Um, let me open up some more files of what we're getting into. Yeah, I think after next week of stacking blocks together, we'll get into, um, okay, that's week number five. Let me revert to the, uh, uh, page three. Not sure what page three dash one was, but week number three, we'll start working with these little lumber pieces. And uh, exercise I like to to use is building a sawhorse. We'll learn how to use the slice command to slice a wedge off the leg of a sawhorse here without, without having to know what, what angle this is to put on your miter saw. We can just you know, use a three-point slice command and lop, lop off that plane right there. And eventually, we'll, we'll generate the, you know, this design of a sawhorse. Um, all right, I just heard a chime. Let me, let me see if I can, uh-oh. Hello, come on, come on. Damien is entering. Okay, there, we're letting Damien in. Um, also in the third week, I, I give you a little, uh, uh, how to put this, you know, a little busy work exercise of, uh, things to make using the same tools we made the sawhorse out of. And, um, uh, I think you'll find that my handouts for this intermediate class cover a lot more exercises than we really have time to do. So I, you know, I give you an extra page here and there to continue 
practicing between classes, if you like. And I'm tempted to say everything on here can be done uh, just with the extrude command, uh, align and slice. Can't remember, maybe this mailbox might, might be a little tricky. Uh, week number four, we'll get into the revolve command. We'll use a couple of, uh, okay, I guess the bottom of the page 4-1 gets you back to the textbook, exercise 72 and exercise 76. Uh, the textbook has a hole for this piston where the, uh, what's it called, the wrist pin, I think, would go through. But for some reason, we haven't, uh, you know, at this point, I don't, I think that's a little bit much to ask to, to place a cylinder through the center of the piston and extrude it. This one can be done uh, easy with the extrude command, you just make a disc. Anyway, um, we run right along. This is a little busy work. Uh, we'll learn the intercept command uh, to make this table leg. And eventually, uh, Leveraging what we learned in uh, working the sawhorse, we'll use the intersect command to make these legs and make a little end table. Uh, week five, we get into some 2D topics. Forgive me if I covered this the last day of introductory. One uh, intermediate topic, I, th I think, even though it's not a 3D topic, is uh, you know, how do you select lot objects based on the layer they layer they got, the color they got, the in this case uh, the the angle of the diagonal. You know, your mission is to delete all these 45 degree lines. And you see, there's very very few that do not have a 45 degree line or are not at 45. Anyway, with uh, filtering, we can, yeah, I'm getting deja vu. I did cover this in the, la in the end of introductory. But with, but with AutoCAD's filtering, you can say, hey, AutoCAD, select all lines that, that, are, that are at an angle of 45 degrees. And similarly, you can say, hey, AutoCAD, select all pieces of text whose uh, rotation is not zero, and you can straighten them all out with, uh, with this database query. We'll also get into putting an XYZ coordinate on different sides of this little house shape object. You can only go so far with X and Y being on the floor of your solid model and Z being straight up. Sooner or later, you need to put X and Y on the side and bottom edge of a slope surface. And so we'll, we'll play with X, Y, Z changes. Finally, in week five, we get to uh, viewports and layouts. I used to teach this the last day of introductory, but we shortened how, how, how many weeks we, uh, we can teach now, so I bumped it into the intermediate. I'm kind of surprised I bumped it all the way to week five with, uh, with these little, let me toggle over here to the model tab. Each of the viewports can show a different um, view of your 3D solid object. So when you stack all, when you get all the, all right, Bergner. So you can have one camera looking at a southeast isometric here and one looking in front view. You know, you can it's kind of like having different cameras set up. Let me admit uh, 
Somebody with an iPhone is joining us. Uh, let's see, six we get. Six will get into making blocks. I uh, can't remember if we got into blocks with two dimensional work. But uh, there's very little change in making a rubber stamp out of a 3D object. So that um, each of these things, you can, you can weld all the parts of this office chair together. So it's one welded assembly. That is like, cool. He is good. Like that, huh? Um, That's cool. <laughs> eventually, I'm hoping I can assign a uh, you know one student to make a, an office chair, another to make an office file cabinet, another to make an office plant, on and on, and you know just for the sake of time, make it extremely extremely crude to begin with. Well, then we'll share each other's blocks with, with the entire class. And as time permits, you can complicate and add arms and you know, wheels and you know, add, add more complexity to the, uh, to the block that you own. This so dude is speak. good. <laughs> um, then, you, then on week six, we'll get into XREFs, where one of you will own the foundation of this little office trailer or whatever this is and Jay Sook is joining us met her I believe anyway by by one student oh, might be me owning the foundation another one owning the the desks another one owning the telephones another one owning the reflected ceiling plan you know, every time the foundation changes, the guy that owns the desk has to, oh, the foundation just changed shape. I got to rearrange these desks. And then the telephone subject matter expert says, oh, the desks have all moved around. I got to rear, I got to catch up the telephones to meet, to meet the, where the new desks are. So it's kind of a, a merry-go-round or a, musical chairs or however you want to compare it, uh, everybody trying to keep up with everybody. And I think that's commonly done in uh, architecture work. It is. <laughs> you, know, you might have, I don't know, 20 different subject matter experts all, all, all having other subjects as a background. You know, the, the whoever owns the like the interior decorator doesn't care about the HVAC and electrical stuff. But um, so uh, what else? That's about as far as I got drawings open coming. Oh, we're, then we'll eventually we'll uh, assign attributes to a block, and uh, attributes are kind of like little databases attached to these rubber stamp or blocks and uh, it really gives intelligence to drawings if you type in say the the weight of this chair or the desk or a, a diesel engine on a submarine the uh, the computer can can estimate the list and trim based on the uh, xyz coordinate of the object and the weight that you've typed into the object and um, you know gets into some uh, you know high-tech intelligent drawings with uh, with with attributes assigned to you know, many of the objects and I believe architects will be able to generate a, a bill of materials you know with the, com the computer can count how many repetitions of the desks are in the drawing and generate a table saying, hey, you got to order 10 of these, you know, Acme model se uh, seats and 30 of these for the conference room and 20 of these for the break room. Same with the windows and doors, and, you know, all the, all the material that goes into your architectural drawing. 
let me open up the final project. Let me go up here to the final project, which I think will take you a good two weeks to work on. Uh, will be a birdhouse. Okay, I'm in the intro. Dumbass. Well, I can go through introduction because he's going to be teaching it. He's teaching intro, intro, and I have the book. He's used that book also for intro. So, yeah, I don't know. Somebody's got their mic on if they're unaware. Why am I having trouble? Someplace I got a file of uh, birdhouses that students have made in the past. Why am I not finding it? Well, let me go back to the 19 or the 2019 intermediate class, and that might be where the birdhouses are. Okay, this is my bird. This is the an old handout I had. Why did it not open up? There we go. You know, I'll, I'll give you a list. Well, I forget how old this file is, but I'll give you a list of eight or 10 or 12 different requirements for your contract. And one of them is to, I want you to um, build some odd shape, a clover leaf or a snowman or this little Twitter, Twitter bird or something and, and use it to subtract away from the front board of the birdhouse. Showing that you can, uh, you re remember how to join all these lines and arcs into a polyline and extrude them into a shape and then overlay the extruded shape on this board and then subtract from the board the extruded shape leaving the, the void in. We'll also learn the revolve command on how to spin a, you know, like a, a baseball bat or something on a wooden lathe. I want you to make a perch using the revolve command with possibility of an exception or a um, using primitives for it. You can stack a bunch of spheres up. It's probably about the same amount of work. Uh, let's see. Yeah, you, many, many years ago, a couple students kind of got carried away and did these birdhouses. And I think on the backs of them, I got, I should still have the student name, 3DFO Enter. Uh, view locked viewport. Here we go. 3DFO Enter. Yep, there's the student name. Back 2012, James McLaughlin made this one. And I have no idea how many hours it took him to model this birdhouse. Again, this is above and beyond the call of duty. I think uh, you can do everything that James McLaughlin did with what we cover in class. Here's a bunch of birdhouses, most of them I made. You know, some of them are just, just made just for the challenge of them. Yeah, I'm kind of proud of this pentagon-shaped one here. You look straight down on this birdhouse, it's a pentagon, but the roof is sloped. So, uh, you know, that would be quite a woodworking challenge to, you know, set your table saw to, to make this Pentagon birdhouse. Uh, also, uh, 
I don't believe these and these have the attributes on them, but I'd like you to attach uh, two or three attributes, say in the, the model number, the data manufacturer, I forget what else. It'll be won't be on the list of the requirements. So you weld everything into a block and assign it these, you know, two or three or four different attributes. So that if you copy them a hundred times, uh, Microsoft Excel can generate a spreadsheet of, uh, you know, how how many Model Seven birdhouses there are and how many Model Sevens have been doubled in scale and how many are on the third deck of the ship, all sorts of stuff. Anyway, again, um, today's, class, today's mission is just to uh, remind ourselves how smart we are or how much we've retained from introductory. I got about 10 minutes to five. Want to take a break this early and eventually I'll, I'll walk you through this exercise and uh, you know, jog your memory if, there, if you've forgotten anything. Take a break until five o'clock. Hearing no objection, I got uh, 451 on the computer. Let's uh, reconvene at five o'clock then, and I'll go through the. Uh, oh. Step one of today's assignment is to make the layer, make the list of layers. Some of you may have forgotten. I'll have to admit these are not in alphabetical order. I saw that a little late. And I'll walk you through toggling from one layer to the next to, to draw the green, the blue, the red, and you know, constant remember the mirror command. Once you made one, um, wish I could zoom in on this. I don't know why it won't let me. Anyway, once you make one double circle with red sniper scopes just simply mirror it to the next one and then mirror the two into the other side and once you make the hidden view of the holes with the uh, what's it called the uh, countersink you know don't redraw it over here mirror it over there okay see you in 10 minutes then
All right, I got five o'clock, folks. Some of you may still be out on break. Um, again, I covered this at the last day of introductory, so bear with me if, if it's a repeat. Um, if time permits, I'd like to get into these images out of uh, maps.google or MapQuest, you know, one of the mapping websites you can screen capture a, a map and hopefully you got a bar scale in the corner down here this one says 200 feet so with the scale command you can you can uh, scale this so that this line is exactly 200 feet long and it's uh, with other screen captures of closer and closer areas, you can align them. I think this is the parking lot that we used to park at when we uh, when we had classes at the apprentice school. So I, I aligned this aerial image on the background so that the roads are contiguous. And um, with this technology, you can you can uh, plot your two mile jogging path or uh, trace trace the area that you want to build the new parking lot. And AutoCAD will tell you how many square feet that area is. There's also some, uh, I don't have a file open, but with a scanned gasket or a bell crank or piece of sheet metal you know it's kind of imaginary if you're out in the oil field and uh, you know one of the rigs breaks down you know take a photograph of the broken part uh, bring in the photograph into AutoCAD you can scale it and uh, reverse engineer it and develop a blueprint for the machinist to manufacture a new part with this uh, AutoCAD imagery stuff. Uh, another thing, if I may show off, uh, years ago I, I cut pieces out, uh, this was a uh, stop sign metal that, that I'd liberate out of dumpsters. And 
a little embarrassed to admit, but I, I was uh, trying to make this thing and I, I ran into the difficulty of uh, bending this steel plate here. And that's where I stalled out. Never figured a way to heat it up and bend it or take it to a shop and have it bent. But with this trailer hitch uh, and an old uh, bumper jack from a 70s car, you can raise this little elevator up and down the trailer hitch to adjust the ball to, you know, to, to a wide range of heights. Um, not only you can keep your trailer level by adjusting this hitch ball up and down the, the elevator, but you can um, tilt your trailer to, to you know, almost make it a dump truck, possibly even tilt a car carrying trailer so you can winch the car straight up the ramp and onto the trailer. Uh, one of these days I'll find all the pieces and get back to building this and see if see if it really holds together. Excuse me, Paul. Yes, Dan. I've bit three eighths plate with a log splitter. Oh ho! Take a piece of wood, like a four by six, yeah. put a V notch in it, and then bring your knife edge of the log splitter up to it and bend it. I'm with you. A neighbor of mine's got a log splitter. Another similar option, I could borrow the, uh, um, you know, a, uh, what do you call a bearing press from the, yes, one of the shops on base and do that. No, well, that's a good idea. You know, years ago, I'd, I'd put a bunch of weld beads across and just wail on it forever with a hammer, but getting a little old for that. Um, another thing, if I may sh show off a bit here, uh, years ago when my kids were in the marching band, um, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean were in style. So we did the halftime show, you know, playing music from the Pirates of the Caribbean. And I used surfaces, not solids, but surfaces to model this uh, mock-up of a pirate ship. Where the uh, what do you call drum major would stand on a podium and dance to the music or whatever drum majors do, and if I do say so myself, that was a very good halftime performance with these uh, this pirate ship made out of black landscaping fabric and old plastic pipes. Uh, what else have I got here? Oh, getting back to um, what we'll cover in the next nine weeks. Um, I haven't finalized the handouts for this quarter yet, but I wanna, I wanna learn you uh, text fields. You can, uh, within a piece of text, you can have a word be a, an intelligent object. In this case, you know, this, uh, Watch it make a liar out of me. That the rectangle around this intelligent field I just did to simulate what you'll see on your computer. But check it out. If I were to stretch this polyline, now keep an eye on this number, 9670 here. I'm going to stretch the parking lot out and uh, watch it make a liar out of me. Regen. And 9670 should, in, there we go, it shot up to 11,490. So this is another way of, of giving intelligence to your CAD drawings. You can, uh, using fields in your text, you could have it uh, print out. Uh, you, I, I often use, a, um, use this as a plot stamp in drawings. It'll plot out the, the date and time that the drawing was last saved. Um, you know, I've seen uh, architecture drawings come in that have the name of the CAD operator, you know, the, the user ID of the CAD operator in the plot stamp uh, of who last worked on it. 
Um, you can also have the have an attribute. You can just add it right here in the paragraph, and another attribute might tell you the length of the curbing all the way around the parking lot. And from the square footage of the asphalt and the perimeter of the curbing, uh, it's pretty easy to estimate the cost of this parking lot. Uh, let's see. Yeah, again, this is a plot stamp. My uh, my phony highlighting kind of got out of sync. But what else? These are very old. Now the array command. You can replicate a, a symbol all the way down the length of a polyline. But we used to use the divide command or the measure command to to replicate and place a, a point or a symbol every so many, uh, you know, every every quarter of a polyline or every 30 feet of the polyline. This is kind of a bad example, but here I wrap these desks around, kind of like you were, you know, imagine if you were arranging uh, lawn chairs around the swimming pool of your of the new uh, Hilton Hotel. There's also a way that you can uh, effectively uh, simulate a ballpoint pen with with AutoCAD. I don't th don't think it's very commonly used, but you can uh, make some settings and just well, let me show you a sketch. Somebody come in. I don't see any buttons to click on. Where was I? Sketch. Increment. I want the uh, length of each segment to be this long. I think it's ready to start working. You can really fatten up a file fast with this. And here I just drew a polyline by spinning my cursor around. It's probably higher tech now, but it used to be a way you could kind of sort of put a signature on a drawing by using this sketch command. Not a very secure you know, uh, high tech signature. That was a, a topic we used to have in intermediate. What else have I got here? Some more bird houses. Anyway, um, quarter after five, got an hour and a half yet. How far have you, have anybody gotten underway with uh, exercise number 90 for today's assignment? I have. I've gotten pretty far. I think I need a few more things, though. Excellent. That's Ahmed Damien. Yes. Oh, good. Glad to hear that. I remember we've uh, conversed. Appreciate you helping me test the Zoom stuff the other day. So. Glad you're getting motivated. I just noticed... Uh, I was about to say this is an old drawing I got down here, but that's, that's a new date on the uh, field at the bottom. For a long time, I had handouts that had this uh, had this uh, counterbore area much larger than it should have been. I was afraid I might have missed a file and 
carelessly uh, anyway. Um, all right, well, let's get going then. Uh, taking uh, page 1-1 one -one of today's handouts, let's start with brand new start from scratch drawing, acad.dwt, and uh, create and make use of, of a set of layers. Now, a lot of people, myself included, we kind of hit the ground running and just put everything on layer zero. And then Lator realized, hey, you know, I need stuff in different colors and different layers. It's probably better CAD habit to make your layers first and toggle from current layer to current layer. But I don't know how many people are you know, have that good of a habit. Let's click on uh, layer properties. I think this was uh, middle of introductory class, week three or four. Every time you click on this uh, icon with the starburst on it, you generate a new layer. You can rename them the instant you create them or go back later and rename So here I, I've gone back to rename layer number two. We'll name that one, say, center. No need to create the zero layer. You can't rename it. You can't get rid of it. So you're given that one for free. Handout says center layer should be red and center line type. So let's go over here after naming layer two center. We'll come over and click on the color swatch, assign the layer name center, the color red. Click OK. Line type is continuous on all brand new layers. You would think you could click on this word continuous and a layer pops, a menu pops up of different types of lines. Center line, phantom, fence, gas, uh, what else, hidden, dot, dash. Unfortunately, a start from scratch drawing only, only, only has continuous because start from scratch drawing fresh out of the box AutoCAD is stripped down, no thrills, lightweight, minimum file size. Your system administrator probably ought to populate your standard default template file with every line type you'll ever need. And later, every text style, a dimension style, title block and drawing file, or a backgrounds, you know, your template file, maybe several hundred kilobytes, you know, if you get everything you'd ever need on it. Anyway, starting from scratch, you only got continuous. You need to load your line types. Every time you load one, it fattens up your file a little bit, whether you use the line type or not. So it's not good practice to load all line types because that just wastes a lot of file space. 700 bytes a per line type, as I recall from decades ago, probably ought to you know, re redo that experiment. I click the load button, and again, it's easy to control A and select them all and load them all, but it takes up file space unnecessarily, and it kind of gives you too long a list to, to find what you're looking for quickly. We wanna, we wanna load the hidden line type eventually. So the hidden layer down here, further down the layer list. So I'll, I'll load the hidden layer, I'll scroll alphabetically and hold the control button down and, and select all three flavors of center line line types. I wish they were named a little differently so they'd be in order from small to large, but center two is intended for very, very small circles. All the lines is a, are short. A, long, a short long line, a gap, a short short line, a gap, a short long line. So all these lines are short so they're used to, to draw the sniper scopes on small circles. Center is about the average, and then center two 
is for the biggest circles, a long, long line gap, long, short line gap, long, long line. So some people just use one of one line type and tweak a uh, property of each and every uh, line drawn on 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 the one center line layer. But I think it's good practice to to use multiple line types. But still don't know uh, which is common in industry. Anyway, I got the four lines selected now, hidden. And the three line types by holding the control button down. I'll click OK. Now I've got them loaded, but I haven't assigned any of these new newly loaded line types to the layer center. Chart says layer center should have the line type name to center. So I'll click on center and click OK. And there it updates the red center layer to use the center line type. With that layer selected, I can click the new button, and the newest layer will have a the next numbered name, but it'll be a clone of the selected layer, so it's red and center already. To follow the handout, I'll name this layer center two. Uh, by Having the center layer selected when I click new, it automatically makes the new layer the same color. So got that. I'll click on the center line type and uh, change the line type for this layer to center two to match the name of the layer for convenience. You, your layers could be named Fred, Joe, and Bob. Click OK. Click new again, type a new name center X2 for the really the largest circles. Click on the line type, select center two, click OK. I'll double click slowly on a layer that hasn't been assigned a good name yet. Next one down the list, again my handout's not in alphabetical order as it should be. Maybe fix it for the next time. We want one layer called dimensions to place our dimensions on. Uh, handout says everything drawn on the dimensions layer or, or later or move to the dimension layer should be in color magenta. So I'll click in the color table of the layer properties dialog box. Select magenta. And uh, because that layer was selected when zero was selected, it's, it still has a continuous line type. What's next? Hidden. I'll click twice. Let me close this layer property dialog box and just for repetition for the newcomers. Layer properties uh, about the first and most important tool of layers is this great big layer property icon here. Everything else is a shortcut. So um, you know, get, get, get friendly with the layer properties icon. And Lator, play with the uh, shortcuts. We'll click layer properties, up pops the layer, layers that we've already built. What happened? I think I accidentally docked, docked the, uh, oh, that's properties, my bad. I'm gonna get this thing float, there we go. Notice they're in alphabetical order. From the layer zero, the C's in alphabetical order, D, L. Anyway, again, you can, change the name by gently, slowly clicking on an ob a layer twice. Another way is to uh, bail it, click it once and right click on it and go to the rename layer. This is one of the things Steve's with AutoCAD copied from uh, Microsoft. 
So either way, two, two slow general clicks or one click and right click and pick rename. We'll change layer number one to hidden. Change the color of a newly named layer hidden to cyan. And we'll change the line type of the layer to hidden. Just a little review. Remember, if what you want, if the line type you want to use on the layer is not already loaded, click the load button and select from this list of, I've never counted them, 30 or 50, I guess. And the tracks, phantom, gas, hot water, dot, dash, divide. You know, select the line type you want from the loaded uh, and load it up. Then it'll be available to select for for the layer. Hidden is already loaded, so I'll select hidden from the list of loaded line types and click OK. Uh, I haven't been checking the line weight column. I guess from habit. So far, they've all been default line weight. Uh, um, um, AutoCAD's method of making lines thin, medium, or bold. So, so far, so good. Everything is default. Let's click a new layer. It's going to be a clone of hidden because I had hidden selected. We uh, let's name one of the one of the next coming next. Layer object, click color, change it to green. I keep tempted to change it to a darker shade so it prints out better, but let's stick with the handout. Click OK. The line type for the object layer, we want to, don't want hidden as the selected layer was. We want it to be continuous. And since the object is the most, the stuff on the object layer is the most important for your drawing, you know, the perimeter of the machine part or the wires of your electrical schematic, whatever. Well, that probably would be electrical. Anyway, I'm going to change the line weight of everything on the object layer from default to half a millimeter. Default is, uh, in fresh out of the box AutoCAD, is a quarter of a millimeter. You can change default to be whatever you want. But fresh out of the box, and I remember it's 0.25 millimeters. So object will be twice as fat as, as lines drawn on any other layer. We'll uh, select this uh, uh, default named layer, right click, pick rename, and rename it Hatching. Assign it color number, was it 40? Rather than hunting and pecking around till you find color number 40, just go ahead and Type in color number 40. These basic colors here, you can also type in the word red, yellow, green, magenta, the, or the number. One, two, three, you know, color number seven is the only color that's, that changes, depending on whether your background is white or black. Color number seven will be white or black to, to contrast with the background. Again, we want for the hatching to be this shade of orange, color number 40, click OK. And we don't use it, but since it's on the syllabus, let's create a layer for the viewports. Maybe my, when I made this handout, perhaps I thought we could use, you know, we could, uh, create a template with these layers and later use it when we get in the viewports and layouts. It's a little early, but just to stick with the handout, let's 
name a view, name a layer viewports. I suggest using color yellow. I've seen professionals have a faint shade of gray, but you, you want a color that is not very attention grabbing. Yellow is about as close to white as you can get. So I, uh, I recommend yellow. I'll click OK. Now check it out. Viewports, in my opinion, should not be used as borders in your drawing. Most viewports are rectangular. I showed you viewports earlier. You can have a viewport of showing different top, bottom, right, left. You know, zoom in, zoom out. You know, each viewport can have a different telephoto lens camera rigged to it. And in rare cases, I've seen a, a viewport that was used as a border. But I think that's bad practice. We don't want them to print out at all. So let's take advantage of this AutoCAD feature that we can control what layers plot out and what do not plot out. You'll see it on your screen perfectly, but it'll never appear on a plot out, even a PDF plot out. Uh, by the way, first time you dimension anything, you'll automatically get a dimension called death points. It never plots out. That's very, very old technology, but death points still remain just for the sake of uh, programmers that wrote programs taking advantage of death points layer. Uh, I think some people may still draw on death points, but uh, there's really no need to because any layer could be rigged to never plot. So we got our layers. We'll click close. We'll reopen. They're in alphabetical order. I guess hatching, hatching and hidden are the ones that corrected. Only the object layer is bold, half a millimeter. All the rest are default, which is still 0.25. Most people start drawing on the object layer. Sometimes I might create a construction layer and draw a kind of a sketch of you know, a bunch of like a grid work. But I think most people start on drawing on object layer. So how do you how do you make the object layer the layer that you're going to draw on? Well, you make it the current layer. Right now, zero is the current layer. If we were to close this out and begin drawing lines, arcs, and circles, everything would be on the zero layer. So let's set the object layer to be the current layer. So we'll hit the ground drawing on the object layer. Two ways to do that, you can double click on it and the check mark will change from zero to object. Or with objects selected, you can come up here and click the green check mark icon. That reassigned the current layer to be the object layer. And up here in the upper left corner, it shows once I get out of close the layer property manager dialog box, I'll be drawing on object layer with text, lines, arc, circles, solids, whatever I'm drawing. Double checking. Don't think I've overlooked or forgot anything. Let's close. Um, let's come back to creating the dimension style. And let's come back to setting the LT scale. That's kind of a steroid for how big the lines and gaps are on line types that have lines and gaps. The higher the LT scale is for your drawing, the longer the gaps are, the longer the lines are. 
to it. So with this way, you can put a whole aircraft carrier on a letter size sheet of paper and by setting the LT scale super high, the gaps can be, I don't know, 10 feet long maybe for the center line of an aircraft carrier on a letter size sheet of paper. The carriers are 1,000 foot, 10 feet. Yeah, that might be might be accurate. Anyway, let's go right, let's start drawing object lines. My habit is typically drawing the front view first. You know, to each his own. But uh, let's start with the center of the front view, draw some circles and draw this arc and then draw the right side. And once we got something on the right side, let's mirror it across to the left side. Now I tend to rattle the keyboard with all the aliases I learned, but uh, for sake of students, I'll try to stick with the icons. Um, with the exception of this 30, we'll uh, need to go to the textbook. Here I've given you the page of the textbook is as, um, what's this, exercise 90 drawing that I emailed. Again, I made a few improvements since I emailed it, but they're minor. The circles are all, whoops. The two small circles are by a dimension by diameter. That's the circle phi. That's global machine shop language. When you see a circle slash, that means diameter. And R, of course, means radius or half the diameter. We'll drop down on the circle icon, click circle center diameter method of drawing a circle. Pick a point, any point, and we will type 12 for the small circle. I don't know how bit, how much of the screen it's going to fill up. Probably mo most of the screen, I think. Click. No, nope, a little smaller than I expected. That's fine. Now, remember, uh, in introductory, I learned you to set Bergner's five favorite object snaps, endpoint, midpoint, center, quadrant, and intersection. So most of the time, just leave them on Bergner's five favorite, and that's all you'll need. Rare occasion, you might want to conduct an O-snap override for perpendicular, tangent, nearest. I think a few textbooks make you force you to use parallel. Anyway, keep your O-snaps set for those five, and keep your polar tracking set for 45 degree angle increments. Most textbooks tell you to keep it at 90 this earlier in, in your training, but I think uh, 45 has a few advantages. Those are the only two status bars I recommend you have turned on. Every status bar except those two is kind of grayed out, indicating it is off. Well, how do you know you might have some buttons that are not being displayed? Well, click over here on the uh, status bar menu. In the first day of introductory class, I tell students to put a check mark so that every status bar button is visible. Because if a, if a status bar button is not visible, you've got no way of knowing whether it's on or off. So have all of them visible so that they all display so that you can see that all of them are tuned off except for polar tracking set to 45 and object snap tracking set to Bergner's five favorite. Getting back to drawing circles, let's click circle center diameter icon again. It's uh, on the ribbon now because it's the last one we used on the flyout. Home in, you know, rests 
rest, uh, slide your cursor over the circumference and that'll highlight the center of the circle for you. Click, come out and type the 23 enter for the diameter of the next larger circle. Now there's an arc across the top here that's radius of 14. Why can I not highlight that with my cursor? Always something. That's okay. We'll drop down and select circle center radius to draw that arc at the top. It'll we'll begin with a full circle. Eventually we'll trim it down to just the arc we want to print out. So click on center radius. Hover to home in again on the center and type the radius for that arc, which is 14, enter. Now 15 units below the center of the circle is, is where we want the bottom of this metal object to be. So I'll draw a a line across the center, excessively long, and move it straight down 15 units using polar tracking, uh, set to, in this case, uh, 270 degrees straight down, or negative 90 degrees. I'll type the distance I want to move in that direction, 15, and hit enter. We want the uh, line to be 42. Uh, well, let's see, this is a little roundabout way, but from the bottom of this circle, let's come down, oh snap at the intersection and draw, take our polar tracking line in the zero degree direction and send it 21 units to the right, and we'll delete or erase the, the 42 line. Well, what I'm doing is drawing half of the object so I can easily mirror it across. So it took a few steps, but I got a half the bottom. I'll uh, erase that little construction line I drew on the object layer. From this corner here at the end of the 21 unit line, I'll draw straight up, O snap on it, polar track straight up, type 8, enter. Hello, <clears throat> my uh, mouse slip while I wasn't looking. I'll, I'll invoke, I'll hit U, enter to undo, be more careful. 8, enter. Now, this little diagonal line here is at a 45 degree angle. It's dimensioned on the left side. And when things look like they're symmetric, it's safe to assume they are. That's why I had a little bit of trouble with the, you know, the dimension seven here being repeated twice. It looks symmetric about a horizontal center line. So. I see you'll need for only one. Anyway, let's send a 45 degree line excessively long. We'll trim it away later. Uh, da -da -da -dee -da -da. There we go. One unit is the uh, horizontal distance between the vertical line at the top and the vertical line at the bottom. So we can start a line here, come one unit to the left, <coughs> excuse me, and straight up excessively long, we'll trim it later. So here we got, we got the makings of this vertical line 45 and then another vertical line. Before we, trim it away, let's add a few more guidelines. 
I'll draw a line start from here and go up exactly 25 units, hit enter, and then come across until we intersect um, with the polar tracking line and the green circle. So now we can trim away and erase and get the right edge of the solid object or this uh, steel object. Okay, I think I can erase this guy. Remembering that I already had a short section. Everything else, so I'll, I'll trim away four whiskers. Click the trim icon. You know, I'm tempted to type TR enter with each his own. Click the trim icon. It, this is why I suggest uh, something's my uh, command area won't enlarge. I, 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 I suggest having three lines of text visible above the, the command line. Trim is one of the reasons why. It's telling you to select objects. Well, what, what objects do we want to select? Well, it's, if it were to show the uh, two lines of text above this, and it won't take time to figure out why I can't stretch the element, uh, command area window larger. Anyway, it would say cutting edges. Select the objects you want to be cutting edges. My advice is to hit enter and select all objects to be cutting edges. That way, no matter where you click, stuff will be disintegrated from the cutting edge to the right to the cutting edge to the left or up or down. So I'll hit enter, accepting the default to select all. When you see the carrots like this, what's in the middle is what AutoCAD is guessing you want to answer. If that's a correct guess, just hit enter to nod your head and say, yep, that's what I want to do. So selecting all, now it says select object to trim. Why did it appear now but before? I won't lose sleep on it. I'm going to machine gun the uh, whiskers that I want to shave off from cutting edge to cutting edge. If there's only one cutting edge, it'll disintegrate from it all the way to the end. So far, so good. What else? Let's uh, isolate this arc down to just this section here that we, we can mirror over later. Well, we need a cutting edge right, right, right here through the top of the circle. So we can trim three quarters or you know, seven eighths of the circle apart. We'll draw a line from any one of these quadrants, one of Bergner's five favorites, straight up. Now with the trim command, hit enter so everything's a cutting edge. We can disintegrate um, the piece of the circle that does us no good. Hit enter to finish the trim command, hit the erase icon and blip that away. So we're well on our way to being able to mirror this piece. Now we can only draw so much of the hidden line of the, the hole drilled through here before we need to see the entire circles in the top view. So let's draw the top view at least long enough to get the um, two green circles in the lower right corner. And that way we can O-snap from the quadrants and centers of those two green circles that build guidelines down that we can later trim away and move to the, 
to the proper layer. Well, let's draw some guidelines. I know that the far right edge of the top view is going to line up with the far right edge of the front view here, so I'll draw a guideline straight up. Again, it might be a better, more professional habit to put these on a layer named construction, but I uh, don't know how many are that professional. I'm going to copy this line because I'm too lazy to move my mouse so far so many times. I'm going to copy it to critical points. That's all the critical points I, I know right now. And I'll draw a circle, draw a line straight across. Trim this guy away, enter. So this will be the lower right of my top view, right here. Center of the circles is seven units up from the bottom of the top view. So I'll copy this line seven units up. And then copy or offset, copy or offset, either one since these are orthographic lines, you know, up, down, right, left. I'll offset or ortho this line over six units. So seven, seven up, six, six to the left will give me an intersection I can target to make these two green circles here. How are we doing on, don't see anybody's tuned out, that's nice. Where was I? Oh, um, copy, what the heck, offset's probably a little more powerful. Copy will work fine for these right, left, up, down lines, but offset is a little more powerful because you can do it on diagonal lines. Oh, whoops, hit escape. To get out of the command, click offset. I want to offset this horizontal line upward seven. So after setting the offset icon, I'll answer the question specify offset distance. That'll be seven. Enter. Click the green line, click up. Hit enter, enter again, and reset the offset specified offset distance to six and hit enter. Select the vertical line and click over. Rot var is where the two green circles will form. So once I get those circles, I can erase these two, two green construction lines I drew on the object layer. Let's see, all four circles have uh, are three diameter and six diameter. Or all four assemblies of double circles, I should say. That's what you see when you get the four X. That means somewhere on this drawing, there are four places where there's a three unit diameter circle, and there are four X or four places where there's a six unit diameter green circle. So these all all four of these circle assemblies are three and six diameters. So we'll drop down circle, click circle center diameter, click on the intersection and type three enter. Click the same icon again, O snap on the same intersection or center again and type six enter. Now we can blow away these green construction lines before they cause confusion. While we're on here, let's draw the center lines. You know, again, it's probably, uh, I forget which layer will, will work. I'll put it on the, the wrong layer just to demonstrate. You know, center X2 layer and line type are for large circles. And we'll soon find that these are not large circles. These are small circles. 
So let's go on line. I'll draw a line from quadrant to quadrant. Here it made a liar out of me. They got the dashed line after all, didn't I? When I did this uh, last time, I ended up having an LT scale, I believe, a 10. So I think we'll have way too many dotted their dashes when we go to this one. But let's continue. I'll mirror this center line from the, from the midpoint at a 45 degree angle and answer the final question. No, I do not want to erase the source object. That's the suggested default. So I'll just hit enter. I'll scale these two lines, enter about their midpoint or the center of the circle by a factor of 1.3, enter. And that looks good now, but remember I use the largest line type. If I try to do the exact same thing over here, I'll, oh, I'm using typing instead of the icons, my bad. Select the two, type 1.3, that's Bergner's factor to solve the whiskers sticking outside of the circle or proportional to the diameter of the circle. This little whisker here is the same fraction of the circle diameter as this whisker is of a fraction of the diameter. But check it out, we got lots and lots of blank spaces even though we're using the layer and line type for large circles. Let's make this one look good by changing LT scale. And then we'll figure uh, moving these two to a layer and line type for smaller circles. Now this is kind of hit and miss, so I'll admit I practiced recently. Line type scale is a bit hard to find on um, you know, it's hard to find on the dialog box wherever it is. I, mean, I can't even remember where it is, so I'd have to find it. So I'm just going to type LTS enter. It's the alias for line type scale. I'm going to start from scratch drawing. LTS is one. Let's type. Let's change it to ten and hit enter. Okay, I think I end up scaling these a hair more. And so that this red line, yeah, what the heck, let's, so it's LTS, we'll change it to nine. Why did it not get, Center line, the plus sign in the middle there. All right, LTS, enter six. There we go. Notice the gap's a little big. Let's go LTS, say eight. All right, LTS, seven. Now I think when we get the lines down here, this red line is going to touch a bad point where it's a little confusing. And I think we're gonna end up enlarging these by 1.1, 1 .1, you know, just a hair to get the whisker past the bottom here and the whisker out of the uh, clutter over here in the you know, cyan and red lines. Anyway, getting back here, let's change these to the smaller layer. This is one of the shortcuts. Well, frankly, you can't do that this from there, so I shouldn't have said shortcut. But anyway, uh, from properties, 
or from this drop down list, I could move it into the center line type. And why did a plus sign not appear there? Okay, I moved it to center. I should have sent, should have moved it to center two. Remember, they're not in large to small order. They're in alphabetical order. So center two is the line type for the small circles. And it still didn't do it. All right, be that way. We'll select them both. Right click, open up the properties for those two, and change the uh, line type scale multiplier in properties to something slightly less. Okay, so I kind of, unfortunately, I had to kind of deviate from my everything by layer law by uh, customizing the LT scale and prop anyway uh, where was I um, let's see let's see let's trim this guideline this one I believe we can we need a little bit to go there. All right, let's trim a few and we'll erase a few later. I'll launch the trim icon, hit enter so everything's a cutting edge. Trim that guy away, trim that guy away. And trim these two away. These two will still help us. Nope, might as well trim that guy away too. Trim, enter, there. So this guy will keep just long enough for the tiny little piece of cyan hidden line shown right there. We want a line across the top here that's 30 units from here. A couple ways of doing that. Did the offset method before. Let's do it again. Watch the offset command. Offset command. You can turn off properties now, though it's some people might leave it permanently on. What happened? There we go. Uh, let's see, where was it? Offset. 30, we want the offset distance to be. Select the line we want to offset, then select which, dis which direction we want the offset to go. Again, copy is just as easy here. Looks like I misjudged not quite long enough, not a problem. We'll use the fillet command. I believe the radius is set for zero, but let's double check. Yep, hit enter to accept it and leave it at zero. Click, click, and there they go, go to a zero degree radius at the corner. I believe I can trim off everything up here. And I guess I could trim this off two. Not sure why I thought I, I anyway. Trim, enter, being incredibly lazy. I'm not going to go click, 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 click. I'm going to go F, enter, and draw a fence line across. Click this guy. That's all the trimming I want to do. To get that little cyan line here, I'll offset this green guy two units. 
offset, enter, two, enter, click, boom. Why did it not do it? Huh. Well, forgive me, I'll try it again. I'll set distance, how to get to be 39. Oh, it looks like I mistyped 30, didn't I? Always something, ain't it? All right. We'll erase that top guy and do it correctly. Offset three zero, not three nine. Enter. Click, click. Now we can trim. Enter. F for fence. Where was I? Well, let's offset this guy, getting back where we were, offset this long line up two units. Hit escape, escape, offset, set the distance to two, hit enter, click this line, click there, click this line and down for good measure. Hit escape to get out of the offset command. Click trim, hit enter, blow away that guy. Blow away that guy and there and erase. These little whiskers didn't come out of the trim. Now we can change all four of these lines to the hidden layer. What else? We'll change this one to the hidden layer. And we will trim, enter, shave off a couple of unnecessary. This guy will move to one of the center layers. Let's see, the handout has two gaps, so let's, there we go. If we put it to the center layer, it'll have two gaps. Now, we still need to scale it. It might create a third uh, short line. We'll deal with that when we get there. Scale, as always, Bergner's 1.3 rule. Good, it stayed at, at two gaps. Let's mirror this uh, circle and center line assembly. Enter about the center line. I'm tempted to say the top view's done once we mirror it over. We can mirror top and the front view over one step late tour. Let's draw some more construction lines straight down. Now from this intersection to, to the intersection right there is a 45 degree line. Let's move these to the hidden layer. I think it'll be, a, it'll get the intersection O snap a little bit more cooperative. O snap there to there. And trim, enter. And erase and move to hidden or match properties. 
You need another guideline straight down the center. We'll mirror up. Oh, let's draw another hidden line. I forget. This might be missing from your book. I can't remember. I've seen this. Well, anyway, we'll move, change that to the hidden layer. Now we're ready to mirror all these cyan stuff straight over this red center line. Mirror, select everything, enter. O oh, snap, polar up, enter. We'll trim away, enter. Uh, isolating just the center line. We'll scale it by Bergner's 1.3 as usual. And here on the handout shows two small lines, so let's move it to a line type that will have more short lines. There we go. Now here's where you know, that is such a small gap that at a distance it looks like it intersects. Excuse me, Paul, Stan? Yes, Stan. This homework assignment, do you want us to put dimensions on it? Um, short answer is yes. Okay. Thank you. I, uh, I'm a little hesitant because I believe I've waived them in the past might have uh, placed a few dimensions and then looked at the clock and says, well, you get the idea. But yeah, let's proceed to dimension as much as we can. And I still haven't decided if I want to collect it and nitpick them during the week or not. Uh, where were we? Let's uh, scale these I am a little bit nervous about that. Let's scale this a hair, and that might allow us to uh, uncustomize these two at that point nine, whatever I did for the. Anyway, scale, select them both, enter, O oh, snap. Uh, we wanted a hair longer, so 1.05, say. Now I believe we can go LT scale uh, hair higher. It made a liar out of me again. Where was it? Six or seven? F2 will bring up the. Uh, I guess I set it back to seven again. Uh, let's see, we can erase a few of these lines. I believe we're all set to mirror the mirror virtually everything except this circle across this vertical center line and that circle. Let's go to mirror. Here we go. Check this out. I'll select everything with a regular window. And just the one vertical center line in the front view far left. And I want to deselect. All right. Click, hold the shift button, and deselect that vertical line. Hit enter. We've got 33 objects selected. And then depending on how you did yours, you may have the same or maybe a, a little a fewer. Enter, oh snap any, on any of these center lines, polar up or down. Answer the final question. No, I do not want to delete the original. There we go.
It's getting a little bit close to the uh, UCS origin. It won't print out, but before it causes confusion, I'm going to move everything into the positive, positive quadrant. We also, the uh, full section view, which I don't know if putting it right here to the right of the front view is, is wise, but if I put it down here, then uh, It'll be harder to put on a sheet of paper. So. Anyway, I'm going to copy this over as the handout has and prepare it for the cross hatching for the full cross full section view. Now, full section views don't have any headlines. They're very rarely dimensioned. Bottom line, I'm going to erase this big circle and move all the hidden lines to the object layer. Got careless with the center line. I'll use match properties. I want the properties of this line to apply to this. Some might say to leave the center line as they are for the sake of this top arc. But let's match the handout. I'm going to scale the center lines much shorter. How much shorter? 0.6 maybe? Scale them down maybe another 0.9 and to move them to a, a finer layer. Now I need to cross hatch one, two, three areas, but these nope, red lines will not interfere. So let's set current the cross hatching layer, start the cross hatching procedure over here on the draw panel of the home tab. Click the three areas. ANC31 happens to be the pattern. Not sure why, if that's default or last used or what. Interesting, the scale is grayed out. Why is that? Well, let's just hit enter. All right, Bergner, why are you not? And hit escape. I'm going to double click on this cross hatching and change the scale, I think, to say 10, enter. Now, on the paper, You want to have these lines an eighth of an inch apart. All the textbooks will say that. But we don't know how big it's going to be on a sheet of paper yet. But we're kind of just about as far along as we can. I think it'll be a, a slight increase. Where are we now? 10? Yeah, 10. I think it's, I'm guessing the handout I did. 11 or 12 by counting the cross hatch lines across the, the green line here. I'll worry about that later. Getting back to dimensioning, by the way, it's probably a good idea to save your drawing several times by now. I will drop down to the D drive, AutoCAD class 2020 fall. Student work, week number one. I don't have a folder yet for all the students. 
is where I practiced earlier. I'll call this one uh, Paul A. One, Paul W. K. One A, just to give it a new name. Getting back to dimensioning, we need to create a new dimension style. Starting with standard, we're going to create a new one. Let's name it, say, uh, WK1. How do I get back to my handout? There it is. For the dimensions, create a new style starting with standard, but use the uh, change the use overall scale of setting to 12. Suppress leading zeros and precision set to zero, zero for linear only. That's another change I made. Click continue. On the fit tab is where we get to the use overall scale of 12. Still haven't gotten these memorized perfectly. I believe primary units has got the leading zero suppression and the precision set to double zero instead of four zero. Now, one of my earlier handouts had the precision for angle set to double zero, but I've, I've changed my mind on that. I'm just Default, uh, you know, integers is plenty good. Set current after we've set the dim to Oh, my bad. I've just modified the standard style. Bad, bad, bad. Can I undo it? It's a little tedious to restore the standard dimension style after carelessly altering it. Okay, it looks like I successfully undoed. I'm going to click New. Well, I thought I thought I did that. Didn't I give it a new name? I'm talking, thinking, and drawing at the same time. Change the use overall scale to 12. Set leading to, to truncate, double zero. Leave angle set to zero precision. Click OK. With our new layer selected, click set current. Click close, set the layer current, the dimensions. And then we'll start with just to match the handout there. Toggle over to the completed exercise 90 handout. What happened? Uh, going across the top here, this is about where I say you get the idea. I guess we could have made some settings so we didn't have to massage, you know, tweak, so tweak a few of these dimensions. That's interesting. I'm not sure how your textbook has it. The handout has dimensioned these two. And grip edit to slide the text clear of the red line.
it's good habit to have your first arrowhead spacing from the arrowhead to your object is a little bit more for the first arrowhead than it is between the first and second arrowhead. I forget what the distance should be. Half and three eighths maybe? Half half inch here on the paper and three eighths there. Been so been a long time. Uh, let's see, I'll dimension these guys up here. We want the 4x included in the text of the dimension. And there's a way you can do it right the first time. Now what happened? There we go. Um, I just assume place it by default and then uh, edit the dimension text as a separate step. We'll drop down to the diameter dimension tool. And again, this smart icon, I guess if you learn it, you know, I'm such an old dog, I can't get away from the old ways. This has got a couple of tricks to it. If you learn the, the smart icon, you might be able to do this stuff faster. I'll, I'll click there, I'll zoom in. Trying to match the handout as close as I can. And then I'll O snap there and try to match the handout as close as I can. Now, how do I put the 4x? Well, double click on the text of the dimension. I know that right, you can't see it, but I know the cursor is flashing at the far left of this text. So what I type is going to be placed to the left of this associative magic text. You don't trust me that the cursor is flashing over here to the left. We'll just hit the home icon on your keyboard. And then you can rest assured that the cursor popped over to the home of that line of text. And we we'll to add four. Shift capital X space, click outside. There you go. If I were to scale this drawing by a factor of three, the associative text would reflect the scaling. This would go from diameter three to diameter nine, but the four X would ride forever. I'd have to change the text style to increase the size of the height too. Anyway. To escape, escape. My voice is about giving out. Four capital X plus. Click outside. Excuse me, Paul. Yes. Dan. Yes, sir. I'm creating the dimensions. My text is good size, but my arrows are too small. How do I correct? I perhaps your uh, template file has been modified. It sounds like someone got into yeah, check your dimension style. And I wonder if somebody changed your arrowhead size from the fresh out of the box point one eight zero down to maybe point one two five. Could that be, Dan? Can you point to where your arrow size is? Oh, right there. I see it now. I got 0 0.180. Huh. Yet your arrowheads are smaller than the handout. And... Oh, yeah. I can barely see them. Oh. And, I did, and I did the um, fit. Use overall scale of 12. All right. That should have magnified the text height and the arrowhead height. No, it's probably a thing with this uh, mechanical version of AutoCAD and the company, like the the like the line types and the, and the layers. Okay, forget about it. Uh, I think you're right. Perhaps... Uh, 
your mechanical is using a block for an arrowhead instead of the you know the arrowhead created by the dim style. And last time I had to create a viewport to make the the arrowheads and the dimensions come out looking good. Oh man, that's all right. Well, that's that's disappointing. I would have thought the mechanical could be uh, dummied down to vanilla AutoCAD transparently and smoothly. But always something, ain't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's keep keep machine gunning away on dimensions. And again, I think if I had to set one of the variables in the dimension style, I, I wouldn't have to drip at it so many of these dimensions. Actually, interesting. You got 40 dimensioned here, 42 dimensioned here. Why is there a need for that I'm sorry. I thought I thought up here this spacing right here was dimensioned as one. I'm not seeing it now. It is at the bottom, isn't it? Doesn't it show it? Yes, right there. Thank you. Is that Damien speaking? Yes. Well, that tells me that we got a redundant dimension in here then. And that, uh, you know, the 42 and the 40 already cover the one. I might add that to the Urata sheet. But I'll more, more likely forget it in 10 minutes. So. Okay, we got 15 minutes. Um, before I forget, you know, I still need some dimensioning done. Before I forget, I, I want to show you, you know, start a good precedent. If I were to collect these things, I'd want your name, preferably on a layer named text, but that wasn't on the list of layers to create. Maybe I'll do that for the next time. Um, but I, I want you to put put text down at least what you're going to save the drawing file as. And well, for a precedent, let's uh, all use our first name, space W K and the number of the week. I guess that's enough, but earlier I, I said continue with the, ex, the file extension for good measure. So let's call that minimum, maybe optional exercise 90 and what is today? 15 September for overkill. Save your file. Yeah, let me collect these. Hope I didn't break your heart. Let me collect these just just to get us in the practice of submitting exercises. Now, last class, I, I recall a couple of you um, somehow figured how to submit your DWG file via the classroom. And I haven't tried that myself, so I really don't know how you do it. Most of you simply emailed it to my Yahoo address. I think I'm going to have to start 
checking my Gmail address. Little reminder, my Yahoo address is P underscore Bergener. And my Gmail address is P period Bergener, because Gmail wouldn't let me use an underscore. Why? I don't know. But, um, you know, at least send it to my Yahoo. Send it to both for good measure if you want. And uh, turning this in today, no matter how much you've got, I uh, don't believe I can ping you. You know, again, I trust you to decide whether you can continue on. Let me get rid, let me move this grip out to the end because you really want a blank space here off the object. I wonder if I got any more of those. Here's where we, uh, remember uh, Dan and I got the, whoa, what happened? Interesting. I don't know how that little red thing got there. Um, there's some discussion on how if a gap should be between an extension line and a center line. And I believe there should not be a gap. So the workaround is to move grip edit it slightly inward from the end of the line. Move this down so there's a little bit more of a gap right here. How did I lose? Okay. I lost the plus sign here because the dim style puts a center mark. Magenta is so close to red, it's going to print out without a plus sign there. So note to self, fix the uh, dim style to suppress the center mark. Where's that? Yeah, symbols and arrows, none. I want none of the diameter or radii dimension. Put a little plus sign in the middle. I'll move the uh, full section view a hair to the left since it'll minimize consumption of paper. Got a couple angle dimensions I need yet. Rats. All right, I'll pick different. There we go. Try to match the handout and then grip edit. Match the handout even better. Anybody got any question? Just need time? How you doing? Still got radii and diameters.
missing that little one unit redundant dimension there till I decide whether to add it to the errata sheet. Pick the endpoints in the wrong order, not a problem. I'll just fix it with grip editing. What am I missing? I think I'm uh, going to change the. All right, how do I change the text type? I want to reduce the font size for these overkill lines. Uh, blew out of that and say three enter. There we go. And I'll again, this is overkill. Don't bother following me. Maybe I'm just getting cocky and showing off, but I'm going to change it to middle center and alter the line spacing factor to 0.85 enter. Okay, that hangs a hair to the right requiring a hair more uh, paper. So I will move it over so it does not. A little bit tight there, so I'll grip edit and slide this 30 dimension a hair over, making sure that this white space is still longer than this white space. Top and front view are a hair close, so move everything on the top of the drawing a hair up. I have a quick question for you, Paul. Yes, Damien. What, what, is, what is the uh, the textile of the dimensions? Standard. Okay. Yeah, that was. I kind of gave you a break on that, but the handout, uh, the only requirement on the handout was, uh, well, how to put this? There was no, no mention of a textile, so just the dim style is identical to the standard dim style, which uses the standard textile. I don't think we're going to get into textiles again. You know, I'd like you to use text, but I uh, don't believe I've ever had a handout requirement for an alternate text style other than standard. I'll have to check. I don't think it's in the birdhouse requirement. Hey, Paul. Yes. This is Alex. Uh, Thank, Alex you. Thank you. I, uh, I got two of them up because apparently my laptop must be super old. I haven't used it. So I had to, had to bring up my iPhone plus my computer. So I'm watching on my computer and my iPhone. So, but, um, okay. My question, my question is my AutoCAD hasn't been working today. Do, can we, can I turn it in a little later or cause I can go into work and, See if I can get it to work there. Oh, uh, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry that happened. I wish I had a short answer. Answer. Short answer is yes. Yeah, email it to me later. And I didn't want to don't, you. don't lose sleep if you don't get it 100% complete. Um, by the way, uh, Damien. You're, uh, you're, you're appear to me as iPhone parentheses guest. <laughs> oh, I did. My yeah, bad. <laughs> not, not a problem. I'll just, uh, I'll just made myself a note so I remember that iPhone is really uh, Alexander. 
And by the way, did uh, was I calling you Alexandria in introductory class? Uh, I've, I, it's not like I heard it. I haven't oh. heard it before. Um, okay. I've got a, I got a lot of emails. I got a lot of emails from uh, the was supposed to go to Alexandria Brown. So, and my name is Alexander Brown. So, I've, it's it's happened plenty of times. Uh, you're used to it. Okay. All right. I don't know where the typo came from, but it. Apologize for it. I'll, I'll remember Alexander. All right. I'm keeping you about what thirty seconds overtime already. No, the, my computer says six forty-four. Not don't charge me time and a half yet. Anybody got any question on anything? Again, please save your dit.dwg and upload it through the classroom or email me. I prefer to use my p underscore Bergener at Yahoo, but uh, I really need to start using my Gmail account. So send them to both and give us both practice. Make sure I, I get it. I just remembered I, uh, I think I will change the scaling of this cross hatching from 10 to say 12 since now that I compare it with the handout, I think the spacing is a bit small. All right, I'll uh, I'll email y'all when and where I get the recording saved. I forgot to check. I assume it's still recording and succeeded. So I'll email you where the recording is if you want to rewatch this show. And uh, I think you've already got the handouts for next week, with the exception of the homework assignment. At the bottom of each uh, week's handout, I got a list of potential exercises for homework. And, you know, usually I let you all decide which of the choices. So. Uh, Eventually, anyway, I'll. Uh, you know, I realize not all of you have the textbook yet, so I'll uh, email the uh, whatever we, whichever exercises we do for homework next week in time. What else? I've got attendance taken. Double checking my pencil notes, making sure I covered everything I wanted to. Um, I'll, I'll also put the recordings on YouTube and send you the link. But uh, please uh, accept my invitation to, the, to get into the classroom and let's start using the classroom. Because without any notice, I may be ordered to use the classroom for everything. Um, let's, I'm going to try to minimize how much I email to your shipyard addresses. The less that goes there, the less of an issue it'll ever be. That's all I got. Anybody got any last minute Comments, questions, concerns? Okay. Let's call it a call it a class. See you next week, folks. Shutting down. Thank you. My pleasure, Dan.